This episode of Six Five Guys is brought to you by Defiance Machine, defying tradition with innovation. Our Bros Rifles, precision on another level. JC Steel Targets, the industry leader in quality AR-500 steel targets. Welcome to 6-5 Guys. I'm Steve Lawrence. And I'm Ed Mobley. We're here in the man cave, the, the deep bowels of uh, Ed's... It's a cave. <laughs> ...of Ed's basement. And this is an episode that we've been having in the works, and we've been talking about it for the last year. We're finally here to produce it. Yeah, and what we're going to explore is the use of a progressive reloader to produce precision ammo, specifically the Dillon 550. We've had an article up uh, for some time now, but you know, as always, you know, people value the video. So we're going to produce a video to go along with that article. Excellent. So I've been looking forward to this and I'm sure many of you have as well. So we're going to kind of do uh, a, a reloading technique walkthrough, um, specifically on precision ammo and doing it using a progressive press. So here we go. All right, let's do it. Okay, so for those that are not seeing me, and I'm actually off camera, I'm going to interview Ed. So, Ed, why don't you walk us through first the press? Um, how did you choose the Dillon 550, and are other presses, you know, going to work with this? Yeah, I mean, what we're going to talk about today is applicable really to any progressive reloader, whether you've got a Hornady lock and load, or whether you've got uh, the RCBS press, or or even Lee has a, a progressive reloader on the market. So these are, are pretty fungible. Uh, principles that we're going to talk about. But I mean, first thing I'd like to talk about is just basic maintenance that a lot of folks overlook. And I even overlooked uh, early in my reloading uh, career, if, if you want to talk about that or call it that. And that is lubrication. And so the Dillon specifically on the RAM calls for 30 weight motor oil. So really all you, all you need to do is dip your finger in some 30 weight motor oil and just make sure that that ram feels lubricated. If it's not, what's going to happen is it's going to wear in, in, in the housing and eventually you're going to end up with slop. So irrespective of your reloading press, use a bit of 30 weight motor oil. Now the earlier versions of the Dillon presses have these little holes here and they are for grease. The newer uh, RCBS, uh, not RCBS, but Dillon presses actually have the Zerk, Zerk fittings. Yeah, they have the Zerk fittings. And so if you don't have the Zerk fittings, you can get an attachment for your grease gun. It looks almost like a little hypodermic needle. And you simply put it on the holes right here and uh, you lubricate it. And I tell you, you'll just notice a, a real difference in smoothness and, and performance when, you're, when your press is properly lubricated. Okay. So now let's, let's talk about setup. And so I'm just going to grab a quick paper towel here since I was handling the grease gun. And while you're doing that, um, I noticed the brass is prepped and ready to go. So it assumes that you've already tumbled the brass. Are you worried about depriming it at this point? Yeah, so this is our 223 uh, practice brass. And so I deprime it uh, during the sizing operation. And so right now this is actually set up for the, the powder charging and seating operation. But what's nice about the Dillon is you've got these interchangeable tool heads. So, so what I do is I've got a tool head that has the sizing die in it. And then what I'll do is my uh, decapping die right here. I use the Lee decapping die. I'll simply have that inserted into this tool head. Now these Lee decapping dies, dies are so inexpensive, you could actually if you don't like changing them, you can actually uh, pre-position them. So you would put it right here, right before the sizing die so that it decaps, then it sizes, 
And then if you'd like to, you could actually insert a mandrel. A Sinclair mandrel is the one we're using. You can actually insert it into the next station. And that's actually what I've done here on this uh, tool head right here. This is actually set up for the 6.5 uh, by 47. So the, the mandrel is, is one that I still move from tool head uh, to tool head as, as well as the, the decapper. But on the, on the 223 practice ammo, because again, we're, we're looking to save time, normally in the match ammo, I'll use compressed air to blow the ash out of the primer pocket and get rid of any walnut media that's stuck in the flash hole. But in, in the case of this practice ammo right here, I'll just put this decapping die as the first station. So if there's a piece of walnut caught in the flash hole, it'll just knock it out. Now, obviously we're trying to save time. Is there a reason that you do, for example, a you know, quarter full bin of brass or do you actually process large amounts? So with a 223, I mean, I'll do like 500 to 1,000 at, okay. at a time. I mean, this is what's left over from what I'd reloaded the, the other night. I mean, so especially when you're using the uh, the powder measure here, I mean, it, it just goes so fast. I mean, it's as fast as, as reloading uh, pistol ammo. Okay. All right, so we have the tool head set up. And uh, any other kind of prep work? Do you fill the powder funnel? Yeah, so, so the powder funnel's filled. I mean, you can you fill it from the, the top here. But, you know, we need to, to add some primers and so the way you do that's pretty simple they've, they've got a primer uh, tube right here and then what I've done is I've put some primers in my RCBS uh, primer tray here you first dump them here you shake them it flips them over then you pick them up yeah and then all you do is you just you pick them up like this it's real simple. It's real fast. Now, Dylan actually makes a tool that will uh, fill these automatically, which is pretty nice. It's, it's a pricey tool, but, you know, if you're doing high volume, it, it might be worth it. And then you put it here, and then you pull this, this little cotter pin right here. And then you, you hear the primers go down. And then what I'll do because there's usually a primer stuck right there. Sometimes there might be some primers in the tube is I'll just go here and I'll just make sure that it pushes down through there. So then you know you've got all the primers out of the tube. And then that right there just weights down the primers to make sure that they, they feed properly. And then of course I always put this back because I tell you there are times where I've loaded this tube and I forgot to put this back in. And then I go to flip it over and then I've got a hundred. They, yeah, they're all over the floor. Now you notice the primers here on the floor. That's, uh, that's, that, that's <laughs> oh, how I do that, the same thing yeah. from time to time. <laughs> that, that's how that happened. So, so we've got a prime and of course, you know, I always wear uh, glasses, particularly when seating primers. I've never had one go off, but again, you know, safety is important. These are my uh, reading glasses here. So this is where you can, can really get some speed going. So I've got, um, I've got some bullets right here. So what I'll do is I've, I've got a piece of brass here. And of course, there's a piece of walnut media in the flash hole. So I'll pull it up. And then, of course, you can see that it, it cleared uh, the piece of walnut media. And then you prime on the backstroke like that. Now, one thing that's important, particularly if you're repurposing military brass, is, you know, I see people, you know, they just jam it down when they're priming. And you just really need to feel that that primer is centered and it's going in there. And you'll, you'll, you'll learn to feel it. Because you've seen those primers that are slightly off-center. They're all scrunched and bent. Or they're bent. tipped sideways. Right. So, so you just want to make sure that it's going in there and, and it's centered well. And then the 550, of course, is manually indexing, which there are some advantages to that. So right now, um, I've, I've done the first piece of brass. And then the first thing I like to do is I like to confirm 
my powder charge. And this is where the fact that this is manually indexing, I think is, is a real advantage. So I'll, I'll take my next piece of brass and sure enough, there's a piece of walnut media in there. And what, what I do is before I put a piece of brass in there, is I always tip it down to make sure that if there's anything inside there, it's gonna fall out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna charge it with powder. And what's really nice is on the Dillon, I can just remove this little guy right here. And so I can take, I can take this uh, case out and I can measure the powder on my scale here to confirm the weight. And then, or if, if I know that it's dialed, you know, I just, you know, the first, first time around, because sometimes things kind of settle with vibration, you know, I just dump it back in here. So I can put it back in there. And then of course this one right here, I need to seat the primer. So we've got the primer seated. And again, this is really nice because it's manually indexing. I know I can just pull it up again and it's going to, um, it's going to dispense the powder. And of course, since I've got the decapper here, I just want to remove this. Now, some folks might say, oh, well, you know, there's a danger of, of double charging because you have manual indexing. But even with pistol, if you double charge this, you're going to have powder all over the place. So you're going to know that you've actually double charged it. But if you're really paranoid, you can get a dye that they call the powder cop that would alert you uh, to a, an overcharged situation. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up here, charge it with powder. This one, of course, is already primed, so I'm going to put it back in there. And now we're ready to go. So I'm going to turn this. I'm going to take a bullet, put it in here. And then, of course, we've got the catch bin here. Now you notice this little card that I taped here. When this thing really gets full, sometimes they'll want to slide off and through this little slot. Yep. So that just keeps stuff from, from sliding out right there. I'm, they, maybe they make bins that have solid fronts or they have an insert. But for now, I just use an index card and I fold it over. And then, again, another brass. Sure enough, it's got a piece of walnut media in it. So I'll pull it up. I'll come down and again, I can feel that primer go in there. I turn it. Again, select another piece of brass. This one huh? doesn't have a piece. That's good. So I get another bullet. Put it right in there. Pull it up. Come down. Seat the primer. And then you just get into a rhythm. And you go up, come down, seat the primer. And that's all there is to it. And you'll get into a nice rhythm here. You can, you know, watch some TV if you want or drink attend, a glass of wine. <laughs> drink a glass of wine. Not that we advocate that when reloading. You can attend a conference call at work. Not that I've ever done that. And there you go. So you get into a nice, nice rhythm. Now, in this particular case, we use the, the Dillon powder measure. And with some of, with like ball powder and some of the smaller extruded powders like you have with the uh, XBR 8208, it's amazing how accurately it actually uh, dispenses powder. Yeah, even on my Hornady uh, lock and load powder dispenser, I think maybe, you know, one out of 10 might be 0.1 off. Right, and for what we're doing, I mean, these are like 200 yard practice loads. Right. And, you know, you're good to go. So again, I'm just gonna finish uh, these out right here. Okay, so there you go. Now, for the match loads, you'll you notice here that I, I have uh, two of these scales right here and so Hornady not Hornady but our um, Dylan makes what they call uh, a powder dye right here 
And so this powder dye would be here in, instead of um, their powder measure. And so what you will do is you will just, you know, weigh the individual charges with your powder measure. And then what I do is I pull it up from there. This is sitting here and I dispense it. So my match ammunition, I load in that fashion. Practice ammunition, I just use the, the powder measure because it's just so much faster. Now, obviously you have two of these RCBS charge masters. Are you finding, based on the speed of producing this, that you're using both the throw powder or can one keep up? One can keep up because particularly with uh, the match ammo, where we're shooting a compressed load and we want to settle the powder. And the way that I settle the powder is with an ultrasonic. Oh yeah, my technique I came up with. <laughs> Absolutely. I use this, of course, I'll never put it in my mouth again. And I found out that, you know, in the time that, you know, you, you put a new piece of brass here, settle this down, index it, one of these charge masters can keep up. So there really isn't a need to, to get the dual charge masters. Mm -hmm. And also I've noticed in the past when I have used the dual charge masters. The settings drift from one to the other? There's a little bit of drift. So when I load the ammunition is I put them in the case in sequential order to how they were loaded. So if there is any drift, the shot to shot drift is going to be minimal. So. If I'm in a match and like if I've got a, a Kyle rack or something where I really need the precision ammo, you know, I'm going to choose, you know, five that have been loaded sequentially. But for all practical purposes, I mean, w when you're loading off of an individual scale, mm -hmm. I mean, I could probably if I if I loaded 300, I could take the first and the last and shooting paper at 100 yards, you're you're not going to know the difference. Yeah, I would agree. So that's, uh, you know, really the, the fast way to do things and then also the, you know, precision way to do things. And now let's talk a little bit, um, you know, for the guys that have a 550 but haven't adopted this, mm -hmm. for the cost of upgrading tooling like tool heads, the funnel powder die, that sort of thing, what kind of cost are we looking at? Yeah, so, so the tool heads run about, 18 19 dollars they actually have a quantity discount now wooden makes some aftermarket tool heads uh, one is actually a floating tool head like what david tubb came up with like 10 plus years ago i haven't tried them i'd like to uh, but those you know may give a an additional uh, amount of of precision but you know i've, I've got the sinclair uh, concentricity gauge and you know, the concentricity that I get off of this press is as good as I've, I've seen off uh, a number of single stages. You know, I've used a Redding single stage, I've used a Forrester single stage, I've used an RCBS single stage, and I don't feel I'm missing anything. And particularly, as, as we've talked about in other videos, is, you know, we insert an O-ring, a 7th H, 7th, 8th, inner diameter o-ring that you can get at ace hardware and that also allows the dies to float but what it also does you'll notice a little hash mark right here is you can just make you know if you want to you know let's say you're measuring the it shoulder you to index the die and, and make yeah and you and you can just tweak it by like half a thou yeah. without having to back it out change the lock ring and and whatnot i know so, that drives me nuts yeah and so so that's what's what's very nice because sometimes Virgin Brass uh, will set back with the same die setting like Virgin Brass, even though you anneal, Virgin Brass versus Brass has been fired say six or seven times. It, the, with the same setting, the shoulders will set back sometimes up to a full two thousandths more mm -hmm. than, than Brass that's you know, been around the, you know, the track five or six times. So it's just nice to, to just be able to tweak this ever so slightly without having to back it up and, and, and mess around with the lock rings. Plus, a lot of you have noticed that if you're not using an O-ring, if you're just using a regular lock ring, they tend to work their way loose. Yep. And, and that just really bugs me. With the O-rings, I mean, they, they, just, they just don't come loose. Yeah. 
So I don't think that, I'm that losing. The powder funnel dye, what does that cost? Uh, the powder funnel dye is, I think it's around $15. Okay. And so the powder funnel dye, because there's a, a caliber uh, specific insert, I have a, a different uh, powder funnel dye set up for for each cartridge. But at fifteen dollars a pop, it's not that bad. Yeah, yeah. So you just you just set it up, and and as you can see uh, right here, for example, you know, with pistol, you know, you'll just you'll just have complete setups that you can just move you know right onto the press now depending on the cartridge you know the head diameter there are these little shell plates that that you have to uh swap out and i've got you know a few observations on on how to set that up because they, they really don't talk about it in detail in the manual so we could go into that so one other uh, thing, as you're producing, obviously, volumes of precision ammo, um, you're trying to save time. How often are you stopping to check measurements to kind of QA where you're at if things are kind of drifting off spec? So w what I'll do is um, you'll notice that my uh, calipers are right here as well as my my Hornady tools because I, I use them all the time. So to answer your question, particularly like the, the first five to, to 10 rounds to, to come off, you know, I measure each one. And then if they're, they're good, you know, I'll maybe check every 20, 30 rounds. Okay. But I mean, once it's set, I mean, you'll, you'll find out that these settings really, really don't drift. I mean, the only setting that I, I really play around with again is, like really, really new brass tends to be really, really soft. And so you'll want to back off slightly on the sizing die, you know, versus, you know, some older brass. But yeah, once you're set, you're, or, or of course, you know, with the Berger bullets, uh, fortunately, all of this is the same lot. But when you change lots of Berger bullets, you'll need to adjust your seating depth. Or, you know, maybe every 500 rounds you'll you'll want to because you know as your throat burns you'll you'll want to reevaluate uh your seating depth and right. you know we have a video on that as well okay any other uh parting words of uh advice things that people should consider or watch out for yeah let's talk a bit about adjusting the shell plate because this is something that uh the dylan manual is um a little ambiguous on okay. so uh, we're just okay so coming back to the shell plate here the shell plate has to be loose enough that it will actually turn but you don't want it so loose that it wobbles to the point that when you're performing the priming operation because you're doing that on the backward stroke the cartridge case visibly tilts over and then you have a primer that isn't seated square so through experimentation, what I've learned is that you, you've got a little set screw here on the RAN that you need to loosen. And then you have a set screw right here in the middle. And so what I've learned is that if you take it to where it's tight, and of course when it's tight like this, it won't even move. And again, if you do it super loose, there's all sorts of wobble that you don't want. So the question is, what's the right setting? And so what I found out is if you, you take your Allen wrench and you go exactly one eighth turn and then you set the set screw, the shell plate will turn very smoothly and it will index properly, but there's not so much play in it that when you prime, you're going to have primers that are, that are seated crookedly and so i've i mean when i was at, at shot show i've i've seen different vendors with dylan presses set up and just because of my ocd i, I kind of went up and and kind of felt the the shell plates and they were just like all over the map some of them were so tight you could barely turn them and some of them were just so loose you know they were they were definitely going to run into yeah. problems so so that's just one thing i i learned 
And then you'll just want to make sure that this little guy here is just, you know, pressed all the way down. And um, and that's about it on the on the Dillon press. The, the the priming system is is very reliable. Of course, if you switch between large and small primers, um, you have to switch out this little piece right here, which you know is about a you know two to three minute operation because you have to undo some uh, Allen uh, screws uh, right underneath here. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's it works really well. You know, dump out your spent primers every once in a while. But no, I'm, I'm very happy with the 550. And so with the 550, I do everything from pistol ammo to uh, precision match ammo. And as I've, you've probably heard me say before that if my house were on fire and I could only run out with one piece of reloading equipment, right now it would actually be the Dillon 550. And we learned at SHOT Show that if your house does burn down and your insurance doesn't cover your Dillon press, <laughs> Dillon will actually replace it for you. So, Well, it's my recollection when we talked to the folks at Dillon that they said the founder of the company, Mr. Dillon, that was his favorite press he, of all the ones that came, yeah, uh, that yeah. They came out with. I mean, I mean, the 650 is great. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. And if I was just doing high volume pistol ammo, I could see how the auto indexing would work. But you know, for, for doing uh, precision work, I just I just really like the manual indexing. I like the fact that, you know, you can remove uh, these little, uh, I don't know what they call them, but you can remove them at each station if you want to take one out and do measurement and, and inspection. So, I mean, I, I'm very happy with the 550. All right. Thanks, Ed. Well, Ed, that was a really informative walkthrough of the precision reloading. And now, you know, I've got a Hornady lock and load, and I'm sure I can apply a lot of the same principles in what I'm doing. Yeah, you can. And when you become high volume shooters like us, a progressive reloader is, is just indispensable. Because as much as I like reloading, I, I like shooting better. Yeah. And, and honestly, you're, <clears throat> you're not compromising quality. Yeah. I mean, the less time you are in the reloading room, the more time you can actually be out shooting. And I can tell you, uh, if you look at uh, some of our recent matches, <laughs> we, uh, we, need <laughs> we, we need to do some more shooting. So that's where we're going to spend our time. Guys, be sure to check out the detailed write-up of this episode that provides a lot of this in a format that if you want to kind of absorb it and have a reference, that would be the place to check it out. Remember, folks, life's an adventure. Stay on target. <laughs>